Hey, Zora, so happy to have you here today with Technical Writer HQ. Let's jump into it. Tell us about how you got into technical writing and landed your first job. Uh, sure. Uh, first of all, Josh, thank you for having me. And I'm excited to share my background. I started uh, my career way back in the late 90s uh, with a media company. And at the time, I was undergoing a, a certificate program in programming. And I enjoyed writing. So when I started my career, my goal was to eventually become a programmer. However, that did not transpire. One, uh, probably because I did not have an engineering background and it was not easy for me to break into programming entirely. And uh, the, the tools at the time, uh, you know, everything had to be done from scratch. And probably I did not, I suppose, have the aptitude for becoming a full-fledged programmer. So I did a little bit of front-end development, uh, but it was for a very brief period. However, because I was working for a media company, I got to do a little bit of writing as well. So I dabbled in writing. Well, all put together, I still did not start my career off as a technical writer because uh, as I mentioned, I, I'm from India and in the 90s, technical writing was not a known field. There were no certification programs. There was no awareness about it. Uh, in 2000, I got married, came to the United States, and I was keen on really getting my career on track, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I was experimenting, and I got interviewed. Uh, somebody recommended me uh, for an open position in technical uh, writing, and I got interviewed, and the interviewer said that I you know, I, I thought I was very confident because I could write. And after the interview, that person said I sucked <laughs> at the interview. And it was not, again, it was not said in a bad way. It was more to sort of lift me up. Uh, and they, I, I give a lot of credit to this person because this person put me on the path to technical communication. Uh, they recommended that I go to school and, uh, or, or, you know, just get some training uh, because it's a very, you require a very different mindset. And I thought doing creative writing is good enough to be a technical writer. So that was one hurdle that I had to pass. So I went to school, I went to Northeastern, I got a formal education. Uh, I did my master's in technical and professional writing uh, from Northeastern University. I had great professors uh, who were practitioners as well. So I had some great training there and I started my career formally in technical writing uh, in 2004. And I got my first big break with a, as an intern at a tech company. And I had to work with engineers and developers and it was waterfall at the time. So that's what I got my first start in. And ever since then, I've been doing technical writing for the tech companies. I have worked for SaaS products. I have worked for storage. Uh, companies, I have worked for cybersecurity. So these are the different, I suppose, verticals or industries that I have uh, participated in, that I have had the opportunity to work in. And in all of those, uh, I, I have worked with several, several companies, um, large companies, small companies, startups, um, So, uh, but all of them in the tech arena. Uh, currently, I'm working for a company called Blackboard, and I'm there. Uh, I'm one of the senior technical writers. We are a large team of about, I would say, 30 writers, um, and we are entirely remote. We collaborate. I, uh, I've also launched into UX writing for the past year at Blackboard. So I've worn several hats. I've had to pivot. Tools have changed. Uh, I've had to keep up with that. And I, I believe uh, I have to be tools agnostic because tools will come and go. It's the skill set uh, and the mindset that you require to, uh, to do technical writing that I really focus on. I continue to train myself. I try to stay plugged in as much as I can. And um, I'm here today almost 18 years later. Very cool. I know you, you touched upon a lot of things. Um, one of the things that I really like that you said is tool agnostic and being adaptable. Um, it's not often your decision on what tool a company uses. It's someone who you're maybe a bit detached from. And they're like, hey, we're using this tool now and you have to decide whether you want to learn it or not. And 
Um, that also is like, if you do learn it, you stay with the company. If you don't want to learn it, then you have to go somewhere else. Um, and just so we could dive into some other skills, you know, we have adaptable. What are some of the other skills that you feel like have uh, made you successful along your career journey to keep progressing? Sure. Um, one of the main big things I think is the uh, to be open-minded and to ask questions, to be curious at all times. Uh, I think one of the biggest, uh, uh, I guess, uh, stereotypes out there is that we are in a siloed industry. You know, we are a siloed, uh, in a siloed profession. And I, I couldn't, I mean, I wouldn't, and I think that is just not right. You have to, this, this profession, this particular role requires you to collaborate as much as you can to be plugged in as much as you can. So in terms of what did I have to do? One is being open-minded, always asking questions, participating uh, where needed, contributing to discussions. And of course, I think because, because I, although I said being tools agnostic, uh, you also have to be open to learning new tools and learning them on your own. So you have to have that drive to do that on your time, uh, because sometimes companies, you might be well set in a role and then the company might decide you're, they're going to sw switch to another tool. So you have to have the drive to learn and to learn, you have to ask questions and it's okay to do that. Uh, not to, um, and then be technical to whatever extent you can. Uh, for example, in my current role, I am trying to learn uh, Python on my own. I do not know Python, so I'm collaborating with other writers who are excellent at it. So I'm shadowing them and just trying to peer code with them, asking questions. Uh, so that's a constantly learning. That is, I think, what keeps me uh, moving in my career. So those are the things I focus on personally and most importantly, tapping into your uh, community, you know, networking, and when I say networking, not just networking for the heck of it, but really finding mentors and coaches because there's somebody else there that's already done it. So reaching out and tapping into that, we have, we have, you know, people on LinkedIn who are willing to help. You just have to ask for help. So I always, I, I have many, many mentors. Uh, so I would not be here without their support. Um, so I think that's something that I definitely give credit to. You, you have to plug in. I'm a big believer in that, especially I think people get sometimes confused on what uh, networking means. And often they think it means connecting with people who are, are at the same level that they are, right? And then they don't really grow. I think you know, their emphasis on, hey, you need to connect with mentors, people who are already there um, and place more emphasis on that. So that way you can learn. Um, some people feel like they're expanding their network, but then they're not learning from their network. And you have to ask yourself why. And one of the things that you mentioned, which uh, again, going back to the idea of changing tools, it's also, I think, an opportunity for many people to <clears throat> take a leadership position and be known as a person who's the expert in that tool. You may have a team of, like you're saying, you have 30 writers and if you have to adopt a tool and who's going to be the expert writer at that tool, one person is going to know more about that tool than everybody else. And that will set you apart, whether you want to have more longevity in your job or seek a more senior role. So I think those things can be seen as opportunities. And it's hard to do that, you know, uh, to, to embrace it. But it's just this is part of the way it is. Yeah, I would like to definitely uh, to that point, add more to that point. Uh, you make an absolutely strong case for that. And I think I, I agree uh, that you, you have to also, you know, as I'm you know, as I've, I've been in this industry this long, and now I realize that over time we've gained skills, soft skills and hard skills. So I'm now ready. If anybody reaches out to me, I have to pay it forward. So as you said, we sort of, you know, I'm not claiming that I'm becoming a leader in, in this position, but I, I have had a lot of handholding from my mentors, and I would like to pass that on to the next generation. Uh, and and I, what I do is I, I mentor uh, 
students. Uh, I'm an STC member, Society for Technical Communication. I was the past president last year. And uh, we have volunteers on, uh, on our board who are also members who are running very active, uh, we, uh, running an active mentoring program. And we have a lot of students come through that. So I, I try to offer whatever I have learned and pass that trade on to the next generation. And then, like you said, you know, when you become good at something, um, you still have to keep evolving because those tools are constantly changing as well. They, those are evolving. Uh, for example, we use Microsoft uh, Matcap Flare and they rolled out a micro content feature a few years ago, uh, you know, and that feature has evolved. And if I don't keep up with it, uh, I'm going to be job insecure. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so like you said, you, you know, you, your job security and your growth is dependent on what you're doing today. So taking that long-term vision of where do you want to be in five years and then starting to work towards that. I may, I, I don't set a five-year goal, but I definitely set a one-year goal. Where, where do I want to be in terms of my skills? I, I sort of set up a vision board at the start of each year. And it's not a formal thing that I do, but I write down uh, my intention. What do I want to do this year? And I try to focus on those high level things. So for this year, for example, one of the things that I'm absolutely focusing on is improving my UX writing skills and uh, learning coding. And I'm focused on that. So each year I try to make sure that I'm learning something and I'm just plugged into seeing what the trends are and doing as much as I can to, to stay abreast with it. I cannot, I cannot learn everything. So I have to pick what I want and where I want to steer my career towards and then focus on those things. Very cool. Yeah, it seems like those are you know, the two paths to go down towards where it's very much in demand. And it's also, it's also exciting. I mean, you may already be doing UX writing work. It's just not called that yet, you know? And um, I think there's a whole another thing that, that you had mentioned earlier, which was in the 1990s, technical writing wasn't really a known thing. And you keep having to learn something and then educate people on it, which is sometimes half the battle, right? <laughs> right. And I think it's still the case. I still run into people, even in the US, in the, in, in the United States. And uh, people ask me, what is that? What is a technical writer? And when I say I, you know, I help audiences understand a product or a solution and they still don't get it. And then I, I have to sort of simplify it. And I say, I write manuals and they go, oh, you are that person. But we are doing so much more than just writing a manual. We are creating content. We are adding value. We are helping the audience uh, improving the user experience. And I think I'm starting to pivot in that direction where I feel I have to advocate for my field because it's still a very niche field. And what you're doing, you know, trying to tap into our community um, and, and inviting people such as me to share our background, uh, I, I really appreciate that. I think that's also contributing to creating more awareness about our field. Yeah, definitely. And it's so strange to me, I was having a conversation uh, actually yesterday with it was a, their VP at um, a corporate bank, and I was talking to them about documentation. They're like, I don't really understand this whole concept of documentation. Like, what is this? And I was like, I was like, how do I even explain what a technical writer is to you if you don't really understand documentation? Um, but that those are the challenges that that are real. And sometimes it seems like to us, they're like, how can they exist? But they do exist and they're all over the place. Um, yeah, well, look, you know, one of the things that I know you're very, seems glued into is where the future of the industry is going and watching trends. I'd love to hear your thoughts on where you see technical writing moving towards. Like we have these segments like UX writing, which people consider part of the design field, but also part of technical writing. And it's sort of hard to understand exactly where that fits in. And then we have more demand uh, niches, like you have API writing and other growing industries like software. So we'd love to hear you know, your thoughts about all of that in the ecosystem. <laughs> uh, well, I, th I think you sort of uh, captured that, you, you are already articulated on, on that, but I will say, I think we are trending in that direction. So the more, uh, if, if you are a technical person, then getting, in, getting a break into API documentation uh, might be something up your alley. Uh, so I think in terms of trends, 
you know, the trends are constantly evolving. UX writing is right now the hottest topic. And I think it's, it's, not, a, it's not a formalized field yet. So there's a lot of opportunity for growth. And I think you mentioned, you know, you might be doing something already, but that you may not be aware that it's UX writing. Um, but I definitely think there is more minimalist documentation. There is a move towards uh, creating lean uh, documentation because we are constantly, there is this continuous improving, improvement, continuous engagement with your audience. And there is that need for instant gratification, even, you know, when you're using something. Um, so how do we engage our audience with the least amount of content, uh, but at the same time improve their customer experience? I, so in that regard, UX is definitely, I think, it, 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 it is shaping up well. It's becoming more refined, more well-defined. Uh, in my current role, I feel like I have found understood what UX writing is about. And there's a very close collaboration with the designers, with the UX researchers, uh, with your product managers. So I think we are moving away from these siloed roles. I'm a technical writer, I'm a UX researcher, I'm a UX designer. We are all, I think the way this, this particular trend is, uh, is uh, moving forward is more in terms of user experience and whatever that becomes, uh, it may not be called UX writing tomorrow, but those skill sets will still be transferable. So I think the trends will come and go, uh, but I think your foundation has to be strong because you're still writing. Uh, you still need those good interviewing skills. You still need to be uh, reaching out to your stakeholders, talking to your subject matter experts, your SMEs. Uh, those, those are the foundational skills. Those are the soft skills. And focusing on your soft skills is equally important as much as you focus on your hard skills because your hard skills, uh, like I said, being technical, the language may change tomorrow, but if you understand how to code or how to read code, uh, then that sets you up for success. So focusing, it, it has to be a holistic approach rather than I'm only going to focus on one thing and not the other because the field is constantly evolving and it's, it's evolving at a very rapid pace. Uh, when I started my career, I probably did print documentation for the first seven years of my life, seven to 10 years of my life. Around 2011, things started changing. We started doing embedded help. Then there was context sensitive help. So, uh, but then since then, I feel like things have constantly changed and at a very rapid pace. But at the bottom line uh, for me is making sure that I am one staying abreast with what is happening, plugging in with my community, and you may not know all the answers. So trying to reach out, asking questions, and making sure that you are confident about it because you have set yourself up with those right skill sets, mm -hmm. uh, I think will really take you far. So I answered many things in that one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, because I think the trends will come and go. So I think it's, I, I, I do focus on the trends and I try to sort of steer in that, but I try to align myself with it. Okay, what are the skills that are required as the trends evolve? I focus more on that than I want to become an API writer. You know, I interviewed for a very big company. I got rejected. Mm -hmm. I was denied. Uh, it, it hurt me quite, quite badly because I was very confident that uh, I, would get in, I would get a break and I didn't. Uh, so what did I do? I started focusing on what were the skill sets that probably I was lacking, and I started focusing on that. So it, it taught me something that, okay, this I, I want to move in that, I want to align myself with that trend, but I didn't qualify. Mm -hmm. uh, so one, being aware, interviewing, I think also allows you to understand where the companies are trending. You know, when you find mentors, when you plug, when you network, quote unquote, uh, not just for the sake of networking, but really you know, it could be a small community, but when you talk to other people, you realize we have interviewed some people in, not in the current company, uh, but at, at a previous company I was at, where, you know, people didn't want to do anything beyond user guides. Uh, so if you're not keeping up with the latest trends, so it could not even be just that there are new tools or new forms of writing, but you have to move online. If you're going to be resistant to that, 
I think you're really uh, sort of, um, what's the phrase, you know, you're, you're really um, killing your chances of growth. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's like, you have to stay, you have to stay vigilant at the end of the day. Um, and if you don't, it, it's just going to end up hurting you. One of, the, one of the big questions that I have that's a little bit of an open-ended question is this, is this idea that technical writing crosses so many industries, right? It's like product management. Even though product management tends to focus a little bit more on software, sometimes it's um, technical writing really does vary. And you can go into medical writing, grant writing, proposal writing, and so forth. Now, for many people watching this video, they're coming from a background of teaching or being an engineer and looking to jump into industry as with their first type of writing job, but trying to find that internal alignment. So they're like, will this industry make me happy? And it's, it's a hard question because, you know, we're all trying to find happiness at the end of the day and um, also find like good teammates and, and all those things. Um, what would you say are some of your tips to find great alignment with a company in the job searching process? I think it's a great question, um, and I will try my best. Uh, when I interview with a company, I'm 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 interview I'm being interviewed, but at the same time, I'm also interviewing the company. Uh, when you're starting off, you don't have I think, you know, you're just ready to jump at the first chance and and you know to get your break. But as you move up in your career, um, you want to, I think, keep in mind the company culture. Are you a good fit? And is the company a good fit for you? I think that's very important. Um, and happiness changes, right? The definition of happiness changes. Yesterday, I was happy doing con context sensitive help. Um, but by the end of the week, I want to do something different. But that's just my personality. So trying to evaluate where you are today and where you want to go. Uh, it, you, you, you have to have that vision in mind and see if the company that you're applying to uh, uh, talk to people before you apply, you know, see if you can find a reference, try to find out what the culture is like at that company. Would you be a good fit? Would the company be a good fit for you? So, when I started my career, I obviously didn't do that, uh, but I was fortunate to find some, uh, because I was part of a Society for Technical Communication even back then, I've been uh, a member since 2000. Um, I was plugged into the community and the way I got my first internship was through an STC member who ended up being my manager and she groomed me really well. So being willing to learn, having your portfolio ready, whether you go to school or whether you're, you know, if you're trying to get that first break, uh, if you enjoy proposal writing, then make sure that you're finding mentors who are doing proposal writing. Talk to them, understand what goes on in that industry. Uh, I think the best way to learn is to really tap into the community that you have there and you have access to LinkedIn. It's, it's a free resource. Um, and then, so if you know what you want, then, and if you take steps towards that, you will find happiness. You know, it's, it's, it's a very relative term, like I said, but trying to, um, and then enjoying your work. I mean, if you're at a place where you're not enjoying, where there's no growth, uh, you know, if, if you're trying to find your next opportunity, make sure that you are setting yourself up for success for the next move that you want to make. If, you, if you're not happy in your current role and you're applying to other companies, if you're not going to work on your skills or upgrade yourself, then it's going to be hard to find that next break. So I think you have to constantly keep learning. Otherwise, it's, uh, it's not going to be easy. Uh, to, to find that happiness, uh, I suppose. It's, it's a hard question for sure. And there is no measure, right? What makes me happy is not going to make somebody else happy. But what I have followed uh, in principle is trying to, tr like I said, you know, at the start of each year, I evaluate what I want to do and then work in that direction um, so that 
I am learning and I'm growing and I'm getting to where I want to. That is my, what is your definition of success and what is your definition of happiness? And then visualizing it and actualizing it takes work. Very true. I think there is this um, way to define it a little bit more, which I've been working on, which is, do I feel healthy? Because I feel like feeling healthy is a bit more measurable. And then usually if I'm healthy, I'm happier. So I'm like, is this, do I feel healthier? and like less stressed? Um, am I spending enough time with my family or, you know, whatever it may be. And yeah. I, I, I think I'm fully on board with you. I definitely take out time to, you know, for some TLC for mm -hmm. myself, tender loving care, I suppose, for myself. I work out, uh, I enjoy, um, so I, I, I don't, I, because we are remote, uh, my company offers me uh, a lot of flexibility. We are there, we are required to be there for the core hours. Uh, but outside of that, I can tell my manager, I'm going for a workout. And my company supports mental health. Um, and I'm very fortunate. But I was at a company prior, where mental health was not even part of the discussion. Um, so you have to recognize that this is not working for you. And sometimes you have to take that hard decision. What do I do? What do I need to do to pivot or to take care of myself? Uh, but like you said, if you if you are not mentally healthy, um, then I think everything else becomes harder. So happiness is that much, uh, you know, farther away from you. So taking care of yourself and making sure that what you are doing, you're enjoying whatever it is that you're doing, you have to enjoy. And not all times, but on a scale of nine, uh, ten, uh, you know, on a scale of ten, I think for myself, if I'm doing seventy percent of what I want, I'm happy with it. For some, it might be fifty percent of what I'm doing is better than, you know, ninety percent of toxicity. So you have to take all that into account. Absolutely, it is not just your profession; it's so many other things. Absolutely. Yeah, it's hard. It's, it's, you know, it's all about trying to find this balance and it's never, ever perfect. <laughs> it is never, ever perfect. And there, you know, life is always going to throw you curveballs and you, you know, we are getting into more philosoph uh, philosophical discussion. Uh, but yeah, you know, I think if you are preparing yourself when you have the time and the bandwidth, then the next step becomes a little more easier. Um, and I will share something very personal. Um, a few years ago, my younger daughter was diagnosed with a heart condition. Uh, and I was in a very, very toxic environment. But I suppose be because I was aware of what is the next company, what is the next job that I wanted to look for, or where I wanted to go, I sort of like had planned for it, I had been working towards it. It made it easy, a little easy for me to pivot and um, and get my next break uh, because I couldn't deal with my daughter's uh, diagnosis and the toxicity that I was in. I was in. Uh, so we had to take some hard financial decisions at that point. Uh, but my mental health, I was broke. Mentally, I was broke. So I had to take a step back. I had to evaluate what is going to sustain me. If I'm not going to take care of myself, who's going to take care of my child? Uh, thankfully, my child is doing okay. Everything worked out fine. But those were some of the hardest days. I couldn't go with my child for doctor's appointments because my manager was not okay with that. I'm talking about way back a few years ago. Uh, so those were some hard times. Um, my husband had to take my daughter at short notice. We had lots of medical appointments lined up. Was I happy at the time? No. Uh, so I had to evaluate, right? At that point, what do I want? And I, you, ha you have to take some hard decisions. But I think just being a little more self-aware helped me in what to look for in my next role. Uh, so doing that self-assessment, <laughs> that self-evaluation, um, I suppose helped me you know, get to a better place. It took me, to, it took me some time, um, but it, it did happen. I, and I had to be patient with myself. I had to be kind to myself as well. That's so good to hear. And, you know, 
Uh, we covered a lot here in this interview. Is there anything that you feel like um, you want to let the people watching the video know? So many of them are coming from backgrounds like teaching, engineering, and, and other fields of break into technical writing. Um, and just anything you can think of before we go. Yes. Um, one, one thing that I will share is we actually... And I, I keep talking about STC, but there are many opportunities. There are many organizations, you know, out there. There's Write the Doc. There is a strong um, community on Slack uh, for writers. What, what, however you find your break, you know, uh, in terms of networking, please do so. But I have an interesting story that I would like to share. Uh, since you've said you have students who come from a teaching background, um, we had one member who joined our chapter. Uh, I'm in the Dallas Fort Worth area. Um, this person was a band teacher and she realized that uh, she wanted to pivot. She wanted to do a career change. She was, she'd been a teacher for about 10 plus years. So a long time, uh, but she was not happy with what she was doing. So she, I don't know how she figured, found out about our STC chapter, but she started attending our meetings. And she started, she wanted to learn more about the profession and how would you do that? You, 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 you know, you, in, you, you interact with the people that are doing this already. And that's exactly what she did. She joined our chapter and she started volunteering for everything and anything. Uh, and within no time, she started picking up, uh, you know, she would just offer to do documentation so that she could build her portfolio. She started building her portfolio uh, and she got her first break uh, with a company and that sort of set her career. And today she's been doing it for about seven years. She works with Disney and she's doing very well as a technical writer. Uh, she actually set up, set, you know, she became part of the chapter. She became our webmaster. She learned new tools um, and she was constantly uh, she, she, she became the webmaster for us. She set up our website. She started doing the newsletter. Uh, so whatever, what, you know, she was willing to wear several hats, uh, but more importantly, she was willing to network and she was more willing to work with the community to, to really, I think, set herself up, set herself up for success. So if you are coming from any profession, it doesn't matter. I think technical, right, technical communication is one of those fields that is a fabulous field for you to pivot into. Uh, but be mindful of, uh, you know, what is required, what it, it is a very niche field. So trying to understand how does community work? Uh, what are the trends? What do I need to do to grow in that career? And then working with the people that are already doing it, uh, I think is the, is the magic formula. You, you can't do it alone. You have to be you have to be open to learning and open to working with others and finding that mentor. I, I, I cannot emphasize that anymore. Please, if you can, feel free to reach out to me if I can help out in any way. I would be more than happy to help. Um, and I think you will find your footing. You'll find that foot in the door. And to make it a little bit easier, I'll go ahead and put your LinkedIn profile right in the description below this video. So if you are watching this video, then make sure to go to the description below so you can connect with Zora. Um, you know, that was so well said. And thank you for being here with us and uh, for giving us your time and helping us learn more about the technical writing industry and how people can succeed within it. And we'll go ahead and rock and roll from here. Thank you, Josh. It was great talking to you.